Okay, hello. Um, so first of all, I want to announce office hours. I haven't had a chance to put this up online yet, but um, uh, so first of all, my office hours are going to be and I know this is a little bit annoying. You'll see why in a second. <laughs> um, my office hours are going to be Monday 11 to 12 and Tuesday 2 to 3. So that's the reason it's a little annoying is that I, you know, just missed them for this week. <laughs> but if you need to see me before next Monday, let me know. and We'll find a time to meet. I have other times for me. Um, but those are going to be my regular times. Well, and I guess I should say it's always or by appointment. Um, and then the TA's office hours are both going to be on Fridays. So, um, Anna will be from 3.30 to 4.30. And Austin will be from 1 to 2. Um, but uh, if you can't make those times, you should also ask them about possibly making an appointment. Um, and I will send out Zoom links for my office hours soon. Um, and I'll also put all that up on the syllabus online. Okay, other questions about that? Um, the first metaphysics exercise is due on Thursday. Do people know how to do that? Any questions? Actually, would you mind, um, maybe, like, uh, will that be reading up until today, or will it also cover reading that is uh, assigned for Thursday? No, it's reading up until today. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, I think it's actually probably doesn't even get to the reading for today, as I recall. So, <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, so in general, they're, they're supposed to be due after the lecture about whatever reading they're on. Um, okay. Um, and I see that the discussion thing seems to be working. Oh, uh, Cole has a question. Um, quick question about the metaphysics ex exercise. Um, yeah. Is it three short response or um, three multiple choice? It's three multiple choice. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, I hope this first one is not too hard. I, I tried yet again to make it even easier than it was last year. I know, um, but yeah, even though it's just three multiple choice questions, I mean, I don't think it should take a lot of time to do, but I do know that the people have found them difficult in the past. Um, okay. Oh, and so I was saying, I looked, uh, I did look at that discussion that seems to be going on. Last time I did this, I didn't really have time to look in on the discussion myself. I'm hoping I'll have more time to look at it this year. I mean, uh, just maybe to get some sense of what things are, uh, people have questions about or whatever. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh. Oh, and I changed that so it's worth one point. There's points. I, I don't. I don't use points. That's one reason I don't use Canvas for like uh, to calculate grades. It assumes that every you want to have everything be in points, and that yeah. Anyway. Um, 
It will be graded. The, it, it will get the discussion part of your grade will be a letter grade, and that explains on the syllabus how that will be calculated. Vaguely. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So there's a lot of things I want to talk about today. I, I'm afraid I won't get to all of them. Um, <laughs> but. Um, well, there, I mean, there's really just two big ones. The first one is the distinction between primary and secondary qualities. Which also is related to a whole other bunch of things. So I'm going to talk about that first. The second one is, at least I'll say for short, abstraction. The operation of abstraction or making abstract ideas. I mentioned this a little bit before. It's really important, especially, I also mentioned this before. It's really important because this is one of the things that Barclay is going to say doesn't make any sense. However, I, you know, I'm going to try to start introducing it at the end today, but I don't think I'll have time to do it justice today, and I'll probably go over it to next time. Um, okay, but let me um, start talking about this one first. So, and before I talk about primary or secondary qualities explicitly, I'm going to talk about mechanisms. So um, what is mechanism? I mean, this is not a term that Locke uses. This is a term that I'm introducing here to, to, that describes Locke's position and uh, position of a lot of other people around this time. So to start explaining this, what this is, um, I'll start by talking about a body <laughs> or body. Right? So a body is something that takes up or occupies a certain amount of space. Right, so body in a very broad sense in which, you know, the air in this room is a body and, you know, um, this pen is a body, right? Anything that takes up or occupies a certain amount of space. Or, um, to use the technical term, it's something extended. And it's something extended, right? So it's not the extension itself, so to speak, but it's what is extended is a body. So, um, right, the term lock, this is an Aristotelian term, and it's used by, again, by everyone else in this period. The term lock uses for a thing that is the subject of qualities, properties, powers, whatever, is substance, right? So a body is an extended substance. It's something that takes up space. And um, just because of that, we can see that a body Every body must have certain properties. So, first of all, it must have a size. Right? Everything that is extended, that is, that, that, fill, that takes up space, has a size, or as Locke usually calls it, bulk. Um, secondly, everything that is extended has a shape at least as long as it's finite. I'm assuming bodies are finite. <laughs> um, it has a shape, or um, Locke usually uses the term figure. Right, figure just means shape. Okay, so it has a size that is 
Maybe I should have written here size. It has a size or bulk. It has a shape or figure. Um, it has a position. That is, it's somewhere. Now, um, we'll see when Locke gets to discussing place in detail that he understands this always as relative. So it has a position relative to other bodies. Right? It's somewhere with respect to every, every other, to any other body. <laughs> it has a particular position with respect to every other body. And that position is either changing or it's not changing. So if it's changing, that's motion relative to that other body. Or if it's not changing, then it's at rest relative to that other body. Um, right, so taking up space means taking up space of a certain size and shape and being related by distance and directions to everything else in space. And those relations are either changing or they're not. And then, um, there's one other thing here, which is, what does it mean that the body is taking up that space? Well, so it means that no other body can be in that space, right? So if, my, if the body I'm talking about is here, this is its size and shape, and this is its position. It's right here, and it's at rest with respect to our stuff around here in this picture, and um, it's taking up this space that it has so that no other body can be in here while it's here. And Locke says, and um, uh, most mechanists agree with Locke, but the most important mechanist of all, Descartes, does not agree with Locke and the others about this. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was trying to do... Someone's saying I'm not using the right microphone. I couldn't tell which one was the which. Is, is this better now? I, I think that's, that's the better one. Okay, all right. So at least today it's calling Thank that... You. HD Pro webcam number one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, but you can still see, you can still hear me when I'm standing here, even though the mic's over there. Like it's, uh, it's not as clear, but it's like it's good enough. Okay. Um, versus where the other one really isn't good enough the opposite way. Okay, all right. I tried to get one of those like wireless microphones, but I I could, no matter what I did, I couldn't get one to work with the Mac. I didn't, I don't know. Anyway, um, so sorry, what was I saying? Oh, so um, except Descartes, mechanists like Locke add that the reason um, that another body can't be in this space is that every body has a certain power to resist other bodies moving into its space. And in fact, Locke says it has absolute power to resist other bodies moving into its space. So um, if another body is going this way, when it gets to this place, it can't keep going unless this one moves, right? But as long as this one stays here, it absolutely excludes that one from its space. And it has, and it does that by a power that it has of resisting, right? So the operation of that power is the operation of resisting another body, right? So, you know, when it's here by itself, it has the power but it's only a power, it's only potential, it's not actual. But 
when another body is actually trying to move in and it's resisting it, that's the operation. Now it's acting. Um, so this power of resistance, Locke calls the quality of solidity. I just Right. You're going to see why I'm confused about what to write here. So solidity is a power whose operation is resisting another body. However, this is very important but also confusing. Locke says that this same power of solidity is the power to cause me to perceive a certain simple idea, the idea of solidity. Right? Namely, if this body that's being resisted here is my finger, <laughs> there's the rest of me there. <laughs> right. So, this body that's being resisted here is my finger. I can't move into the space that's occupied by this body. So, one operation of this power is, is to prevent my finger from going farther. But another operation of this same power is to cause me, here's my mind, to carry out this operation, well I guess this is all inside my mind, to carry out this operation of perceiving a certain simple idea, the idea of solidity. Right, so this is the operation of sensation. This here, is the idea of solidity, right? And therefore, just as the power that a body has to cause me to perceive white is called the quality of whiteness. And the idea that it causes me to perceive is called the idea of whiteness. So this power is called the quality of solidity. And the idea it causes to be perceived is called the idea of solidity. Only here we're adding something else about this power of solidity, namely, that or quality of solidity, namely that it also stops my finger from going into the body. Right, so this is it's it's this is a strange thing about the quality of solidity. Right? On the on on the one hand, Locke says that like the quality of light, whiteness, it's a simple idea. Um, so it can't be defined. This is, um, book two, chapter four, section six. If anyone asks me what this solidity is, I send him to his senses to inform him. Let him put a flint or a football between his hands and then endeavor to join them, and he will know. That's the only way I can tell you what it is, right? Just like if you ask me, you know, um, what is the quality of whiteness? Um, all I can do, well, I guess, or what is the idea of whiteness? All I can do is hold up something white and have you look at it, and then you will know. But, I mean, if you're blind, for example, and uh, I can't do that, then there's no way I can tell you. Um, so Locke is saying solidity is like that. But, nevertheless, 
There is something else I can tell you about solidity. There's something else I know about it because somehow we know something about the power that is, or quality that is the cause of the idea of solidity. Right, so at the very beginning of book two, chapter four, which the whole thing is about the idea of solidity, um, The idea of solidity we receive by our touch, and it arises from the resistance which we find in body to the entrance of any other body to the place it possesses till it has left it. Right? So that's what I was just saying. Aside from, so to speak, the nature of this simple idea, which we know but can't convey except by, I can't tell you except by telling you to sense it yourself. I also know something about it, namely that it arises from the resistance there is, we find, in body. In what sense of find? But anyway, the resistance there is in body to any other body occupying its place till it has left it. Um... So this is, it's strange that we know this extra thing about the idea of solidity. We don't know something like this about the idea of whiteness, according to, to Locke. Um, and in fact, um, um, what I'm going to claim is, I think this is right, that the, diff, the, the, the fact that we know this extra thing about the idea of solidity has something to do with the fact that um, the quality of solidity is a primary quality. Okay, so... Um, Um, I guess uh, I'm going to, you know, return to the to primary and secondary qualities, but just read this. This is going to be the list of primary qualities. Sometimes he mentions other. I mean, first time. Sometimes he mentions number, which is a little bit of a different thing, but. Um, and uh, sometimes he mentions texture, which has to do with a body that has parts, the, the size, shape, position, and motion of the parts relative to each other is what he's calling the texture. So it's not really an extra property on the list. Um, so this is basically the list of, of primary qualities. Um, now, um, as I said, it's also the list of properties that a body must have in order to be an extended substance. These are the properties of extended substances as such. Every extended substance or every finite extended substance must have a size, shape, position, must be in motion or rest, and um, if we agree with Locke and everyone else except Descartes about this, it must have this power of excluding other bodies from its space. Um, right? Because otherwise we don't understand what it means that that's its space. It takes up that space and doesn't allow other bodies in it while it's there. Um, and... Um, there's something else that comes along with this list, however, which is um, that this explains how it's possible for one body to affect another body. How it's possible for one body to cause a property of another body. And the way it's possible, if let's say all 
the only properties the two bodies have, call them A and B, are the ones on this list. So here's A and here's B. So um, the way A can affect B is by pushing it. Right, which means, or by impulse, as they say. It means that, just as in the picture I drew before, when A gets to here, either A has to stop or B has to move. Because A can't keep going while B is there. So, I mean, either B can stop A by impulse, um, meaning it affects A by changing its motion into rest, or A can affect B by impulse. B was sitting at rest, now it has to move, or else for A, it has to make room for A. Or, of course, something in between could happen. They could bounce off each other or whatever. But the, the point is, this is how they can act on each other. Because they resist being in each other's space. They can push each other. All right. So um, these are all the properties that extended substances, that is, bodies as such, have. And this is the way bodies as such can act on each other. And mechanism is the view that those properties are the only properties that bodies really have. And therefore, this is the only way that bodies can act on each other. Um, that is, every whole body has all of these properties and only these properties, and each of its parts, which are also bodies, also have these properties. Um, so what about the other properties we tend to attribute to bodies like color, co uh, heat, and cold? Those are the clearest cases. Whether we really think of bodies as having a taste and smell exactly, I'm not sure, or sound. But um, those things are usually, including by Locke, get kind of like, it's assumed that they're kind of the same. <laughs> so, um, but in any case, clearly color, heat, and cold, we tend to think of bodies as happening, as having those properties. But according to mechanists, those properties are not really in bodies. Where are they? Where they're, they're only in us. They're in our sensations, somehow. So when I say the body is red, what I really mean is it gives rise to a red sensation in me, or something like that. But the body itself only has these properties, really. And what about cases where bodies seem to act on each other in other ways than by pushing, like a magnet? or like a heavy body drawn towards the earth? Um, well, um, there must really be some small bodies we don't see making that happen by pushing. Right, so when, when the magnet, let me have space here, I have to erase this big picture, maybe my big finger. When the magnet attracts the piece of iron, although we can't see it, there must really be a magnetic fluid. You know, there's like things that flow out of the magnet and flow back around here and push the iron towards the magnet or something like that. Um, because uh, if the body only has these properties, it can only act on other bodies by contact impulse by pushing them out of the way. So um, uh, it can't act at a distance. Um, um, 
So this is relevant to a question I saw some people talking about in the discussion, which is a good question, namely, could we discover new primary qualities? This list is the list of primary qualities, and as I said, it's also the list of properties that belong to bodies as such, the, the mechanistic properties, right? And um, so, and I think the answer is supposed to be that, um, no, we can be sure we have the whole list of the properties that are necessary to make something a body. But it's not like Locke actually argues for that. But I think that's supposed to be what, what we're supposed to think. So at least as far as extended substances go, this is supposed to be the complete list. Um, okay, so that, so that theory is mechanism. And like I said, in one version or another, a lot of people in the 17th century agree with this. Um, but um, so maybe... The only properties of body are extension and its modes, is one way people put this. Right? The only properties bodies have is that they're extended substances and they have all of the properties that is, it takes to be an extended substance. Um, those are the only real properties of bodies. So this, everyone agrees with this, but it leaves two questions um, open. So, I mean, first of all, let's say, What does this mean? <laughs> what does it mean that certain properties are really in bodies and others are not? That has, you know, like to make sense of this, you have to explain that. Um, what it is for a property to really be in something. And another question is, Why should we believe it? Why think that the only properties that are really in bodies are those, pro are those extension and its modes? Why not? I mean, it seems like they have colors, for example. Um, so Galileo, Descartes, Locke, Hobbes, Spinoza, sort of Leibniz, not really Barclay or Hume, but we'll see what they think. But, um, but all those people I mentioned before are all mechanists, but they give slightly different answers to these questions, right? That is, they don't understand exactly the same thing by really in body. And they also don't necessarily have exactly the same reasons for believing that only these are really in body. So... Um, so when we talk about the primary secondary quality distinction in Locke, we're talking about Locke's um, answer to those questions, basically. Okay, there's a question in the chat. Okay, quick terminology. Real and primary qualities are synonyms, and secondary and imputed qualities are synonyms. Um, as Locke uses those terms, I think that's right. He doesn't talk about imputed qualities very often. He does, there is one place that I remember from the reading, and you're probably thinking of that too. Um, but it's not, a, it's not a term he uses a lot. Real qualities are definitely the same as primary qualities. 
Um, okay, so um, so now I want to try to explain what Locke's answer to these question is. To these questions is so. Um, um, but to do that, I want to go into another little kind of metaphysical interlude, right? So last week I talked about power versus operation. So now I'm going to talk about bare powers versus real power. Um, now, I mean, if you know, if you read what he says about primary and secondary qualities, you'll recognize that he talks about this a lot: bare powers versus real powers. But let me try to explain what he means by it. So, in a way, this distinction is easy to understand. A real power is a power that is a separate thing, right? So, the word "real" comes from the Latin word race, which means thing, right? So real means it's like global from globe or like spinal from spine. Real comes from race. It means like thingle. <laughs> um, and so like a real power is a power um, that is a separate thing. Separate from what? Well, so what has a power is a substance. And maybe I should have drawn this over here. In the case of a real power, there's a thing in the substance that is the power. Now, that's hard, I know, hard to understand without an example. And I'm about to, to explain why it's hard to give an example. But, um, but uh, in any case, the contrasting case which is a bare power is supposed to be that there's the substance and it has this power but there's no thing that is the power so it's a bare power meaning it's only a power it's not also a thing it's barely a power merely a power now i mean in the pictures it's easier to draw this picture than this picture. Like, I can't draw the power because the whole point is there is no thing that is the power. You can't draw it. But it's actually easier to give an example of a bare power than an example of a real power. So um, let me talk about an example of, of bare powers first. An example of two bare powers. Um, so, um, you know, the sun... This is one of Locke's examples. The sun has a power to darken a fair face. So here's a fair face, and the sun has a power to make it get darker. And the sun also has a power to whiten wax, right? So here's some like yellow wax, and you leave it in the sun, and after a while, it gets white. So those are two different powers because they have two different operations, right? Like the operation of making something darker is not the same as the operation of making something white two different operations, and therefore they're two different powers. But there aren't really two different things in the sun that are these two powers. 
At least not as far as Locke knows. Now, I don't know, maybe really it's different parts of the spectrum that are doing these two things or whatever, but never mind that. I mean, the, the idea here is that the sun is just sitting here doing its usual sun thing, giving out light and heat or, you know, to put it more accurately, remember, according to Locke, how can it act on things by impulse? So what it's doing is sending out like streams of little particles. That's what's actually going on at the sun. These little particles are going out all the time. When they hit this face, they make it darker. When they hit this wax, they make it lighter. Um, but the sun was just doing both, is doing both by just doing the same thing it always does. So, um, first of all, this means that, like, if you ask, like, where is the fair face darkening power when there's no fair face? The answer, it isn't really anywhere. Right? I mean, you can only really say that it exists when it's operating. Because when you take away the, the fair face, all you have left is, you know, what the sun always does, whether there's a face there or not. And similarly, if you take away the wax, the wax whitening power is not really there. But also... Um, Suppose we denominate the sun. Suppose we denominate the sun fair face darkening. So this is a description of the it's it's a description of the sun by its relation to a certain nomen or name. Um, and what is the name? Well, the name would be um, something like. Fair face darkeningness. <laughs> right? Like, think about this is similar to calling the sun white by relation to whiteness. This is called denomination. So, in the case of this power, when we call the sun fair face darkening, um, the name fair face darkeningness from which this denomination is derived is not the name of anything. Right? There is no thing, the fair face darkeningness of the sun. And I know that's a really weird way to describe this. <laughs> um, it's not necessarily a really illuminating way to describe it. I mean, who asked for this name here? I mean, you know, why? Well, but the reason I'm telling you this is because this is called nominalism about this power. Nominalism says that um, the name of the power is a bare name or pure name. It's not the name of anything. So we remember in the first lecture, I, I said that nominalism is one of the things that 
the British empiricists seem to have inherited from medieval British philosophy. Um, so, um, in particular, here we have nominalism about powers or properties, saying there's there's just a name of the power, but there's no thing. Whereas the opposite of nominalism is realism. Realism would say fair face darkening this is a thing. Right? Again, because real comes from race, meaning thing. Um, okay. So, um, so bare powers are powers that have a merely nominal existence, so to speak. Um, as opposed to real powers, which are things. Okay, so here's another question from April. Would it be fair to say that the sun has the power to radiate something and that the radiation has different effects on different objects? That the subjective effect is the bare power? Well, the effect is the operation, though. Not the power. So, I mean, um, the sun has a power to send out these little particles, um, but uh, the whitening of the wax or the darkening of the face um, are not the same as the particles being sent out. Um, and they're not the same as the power of darkening a face or whitening wax. They're the operation of darkening a face or whitening wax. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question or not. Yeah, I think so. I just kind of, it's easy to mix up words, but thank you. It is, yeah, it is easy. And I, I think this is a better way to try to explain it than I've tried to in the past, but I'm, now that I'm doing it, I'm not sure. But, you know, what I thought this year was, look, explain, give an example of a bear power first. That's easier to understand. Now that I'm saying it, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm explaining it in such a complicated way, I'm making it harder to understand. But, you know, you understand what I mean when I'm saying it's, it's the same sun. It's the same... Um, the powers of face darkening and wax whitening are not separate aspects of the sun. Well, and I think that was my question. It's like, right, ultimately, like, we can say like it comes from radiation, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, that although the effect is different on different things, like it might darken or whiten, um, like, right, it's... Like, ultimately, both come from the same, would right. it be proper well, to say, operation? Well, so, I mean, you know, notice that the way I set up the example and explaining as Locke would understand it, yes, it's true. In both cases, what's really going on is the power to eject these tiny little bodies. That's something that can be described entirely in terms of primary qualities. Um, but the question is, you know, what about the power to make this look different or that look different? Where is that? And the answer is you can't like separate it out in, in here. All there, all there is in here is the property, the power to eject these little particles. Um, but I was trying not to bring in a primary secondary quality distinction right away because I think, I mean, the point is, Locke thinks everyone agrees that this is a bare power, even those who are realists about the sec what he calls secondary qualities, right? That in this case, everyone agrees that however this happens, it's not like the sun has two different things in it, one the power of doing this and the other the power of doing that. Um, does it also have something to do with the quality of the thing to become darkened? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously it has something to do, right? And so, you know, this thing has a passive power to be darkened by the sun. 
And this operation can never happen unless this thing has that passive power. Um, so, um, but I'm just focusing on the sun's powers here. We could turn around and ask about this. So is that passive power a real power or not? But I'm just focusing on the sun's power. If you're familiar with Leibniz's phrase, well, it's not just Leibniz's phrase, of being contained eminently, would that be comparable to the potential power of the sun as described by Locke? Well, um, So, um, so according to Thomas Aquinas, for example, the sun um, is able to cause spontaneous generation of mice because it contains the form of mouse in an eminent sense. <laughs> um, so it's like more a mouse than a mouse is, so to speak. Or it's like a mouse on a higher level of being, on a level of being in which being a mouse and being a horse and so on and so forth are not exactly different, right? So when you go to higher levels of being, you get more unity and simplicity. Um, and, you know, so according to Thomas Aquinas, that appear, applies to the difference between sublunar things and celestial things. And the sun, you know, can, has the prop, pa, property of life in an eminent sense, has more life than sublunar living things. And that's what enables it to give life to living things, to sublunar living things. Now, I mean, um, when you get to Descartes and Leibniz, I think... Um, you know, anyone post-Galileo, they don't really believe that the sun is has a is a different mode of being than than we are. So it wouldn't really contain things in an eminent sense. Well, except, except I guess you could say that. The relationship between a real thing and the idea it causes is always one of kind of like eminent uh, paradigmatic causation, as they say. Um, but is that the same as what Locke is saying here? I don't. I mean, it's certainly, I don't think Locke would want to describe it that way, but you'd think I would have thought before about exactly what the relationship between these two things is. And probably one reason I haven't is because 100B and 100C are different courses. <laughs> so, I, uh, so it's a good question. There, it's definitely it's definitely in the same ballpark of ideas, but I don't think that Locke would want to say anything like that the power of face darkening in the sun is face darkening in an eminent sense or something like that. It, eminent means higher. Right, that's that's all it means. It's not that mysterious. Um, well, I mean, it's really mysterious. But anyway, what it means isn't mysterious. Okay, here's another question from Carissa: Is radiation a wave, bare power, or particles? Can we understand the distinction between nominalism and the power and realism of the power, nominalism of the power and realism of the power in this way? Well, I mean, so Locke, first of all, straight out thinks that light is particles. He doesn't think that it's a wave. Uh, if he did think it was a wave, he would think that it, it was a wave in the motion of particles. 
it's like a water wave, <laughs> right? Um, he wouldn't think there was some other kind of wave that could be uh, um, that's, you know, I mean, light turned out to be, everything turned out to be much stranger than mechanists thought it was. <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of hard to to read that back into Locke and see what he would say about it. But, um, but I don't think, but to, to get to the other part of your question, like, what we're saying is real or not real here is not the particles. Those for sure are real. The question is whether the power, it's, it's a much more abstract question. That's why this is so hard to explain <laughs> and draw pictures of and whatever. The, the, what the question we're asking is whether the power to, to darken the face is a thing or not. So like, I mean, what would help now, let me go on to this, you know, what would help now is I could give you an example of something that is a real power. Then you could see what does it mean? What happens in a case where the power is a thing in the substance? Um, now, um, there's, there's some problems, though, in the face of giving examples of real powers. So... First of all, Locke is mostly a nominalist about powers and therefore about qualities, because remember, qualities are powers, right? Qualities are the powers things have to cause us to perceive ideas. So Locke is mostly a nominalist about all of that stuff, except for certain exceptions. So like by default, so to speak, as far as Locke is concerned, a power is not a thing. A substance is a thing. It has powers. That doesn't mean there's extra things. <laughs> it just means the substance has effects on other substances. Um, okay, but he does recognize some exceptions. Now, the exceptions are almost the opposite of the exceptions that previous nominalists accepted. So if we were to compare Locke to William of Ockham and see what things they put on the list of real powers or real qualities versus what things they are nominalists about, considered to be bare powers, um, we would find the lists almost switched. <laughs> um, but the reason the lists have switched, I think, is that Locke has a new and I think better, but also harder to understand <laughs> um, explanation of what it means that there's another thing in the substance that is the power. So I'm going to try to explain that, but um, um, just to motivate why it's worth trying to understand that, what are the exceptions that Locke allows? The exceptions are basically the primary qualities. The primary qualities are real powers. The secondary qualities are bare powers. which we often take to be real powers, Locke says, but incorrectly, right? So the, um, so if I take the sun's power to appear bright or to feel hot, um, um, there we're tempted to say there is something in the sun, light, heat, color, etc. It's in the sun, and that's why it causes those sensations in me. But uh, those are all secondary qualities, and Locke says, no, it's not true. Those are bare powers. The real powers are the powers the sun has to cause the, I, me to perceive the ideas of primary qualities. And those are the only real powers. Um, so that's Locke's answer to this, if I understand him correctly. 
right? What does it mean to say that only the primary qualities are really in bodies? It means only the primary qualities are real powers of bodies. The secondary qualities are bare powers of bodies. Um, And therefore, the primary qualities, um, remember, I said, if there's no face here, in a sense, the power of face darkening isn't anywhere. But if the power of face darkening were a thing in the sun, then of course, this thing would still be there, even if there was no face, right? So in that case, we could say, the sun is face darkening, has face darkeningness, whether there are any faces or not. So it's going to be the same thing with the distinction between primary qualities and secondary qualities. Right? So this is how it works. Let me go in the opposite order. Let's say a snowball is white. So according to Locke, it's completely correct to say that the snowball is white. I mean, it's potentially confusing because white is also a name for an idea. And the snowball is not an idea, it's a body. But nevertheless, it's right to say that the snowball is white. That is, it has the quality of whiteness. That is, it has the power to cause us to sense the idea of white. And we denominate it white from that power. But there's no such thing as whiteness in the snowball. Right? And I'm emphasizing thing, because if I didn't emphasize it, if I said there's no such thing as whiteness in the snowball, I'd be saying the white snowball isn't white. That's not true. The snowball is white. But there's no such thing as whiteness in the snowball. The snowball is just doing its snowball thing. In this case, what it's doing is it has little tiny parts near the surface that reflect light. Again, light is little bodies, but, you know, it reflects light back in different ways um, in such a way that uh, when those things strike my eye, they somehow, through my nerves and whatever, cause me to perceive the idea of white. Um, but, uh, but there's no part of this that's specifically the power to cause me to see white. The snowball is just reflecting particles because of the size, shape, and position of its very small parts. Um, so when uh, I see the snowball, um, that power of whiteness is in operation, and I can, I can say where it is, so to speak, right? It's like operating on me, making me perceive the idea of white. But if no one's looking at the snowball, then the whiteness isn't anywhere, because it's no thing in the snowball. Whereas, on the other hand, take the shape of the snowball. So, yeah, how can you even draw this? That's part of the problem here. Right? Snowball. We're thinking now of the snowball as a substance, and it has as a property this shape. There's the shape, right? It's round. So the claim is there is such a thing as the shape of the snowball. The shape of the snowball isn't just, right? It isn't barely its power to cause me to perceive that shape. It's actually a thing in the snowball. And so it's there even when I'm not perceiving it. And even if there's no one to perceive it, right? Even if everyone dies and there's no eyes left in the world or everyone goes blind or whatever, um, there's, n there's no one left to perceive that shape. Well, actually, we should probably think of the shape as tangible. So 
Yeah, but stick with the first case. Everyone dies, so there's no one left to perceive the shape. Nevertheless, the shape is a thing which is there whether anyone perceives it or not. So um, that's, that's what Locke is trying to say about primary versus secondary qualities. And I'll just say without trying to explain William of Ockham's view on the other hand, that William of Ockham would say the opposite about those two examples. Right? William of Ockham, as I mentioned him before, he's the most famous and one of the most uh, radical medieval nominalists, um, uh, says that um, would say in those two examples, the whiteness is a thing in the snowball. It would be there whether we're perceiving it or not. The shape of the snowball is no different than the snowball itself. There's no different thing there. Um, all right, so Locke has switched those, but, but he's retained the terminology and he's still thinking basically of the same issue, I think. Okay, I know that's kind of confusing. Um, I haven't, still haven't really given an example of a real power because I haven't really explained what this thing is and how it's different from the snowball. I mean, William of Ockham's position is actually kind of easier to get, right? He's going to say, why can't you draw this picture? You're trying to draw the shape of the snowball in one place and the snowball somewhere else. They, you know, they can't be, they can be kind of abstractly considered differently, but they can't actually be apart. You can't draw pictures of them apart or something. There isn't really a thing that's the shape. But Locke is saying, on the contrary, a shape is one of the few powers of the snowball that actually is a thing in the snowball. Okay, are there questions about that? I guess, you know, maybe I should say, like, why am I, why am I presenting it this way? Uh, you know, it would be easy to say, okay, Locke thinks that the following properties are really in bodies and the following are not. And I could give you the list. Um, and, uh, and I could say, well, you know, he thinks that the snowball just looks white, but it really is round. And that would be easier to understand it, up to a point, but only up to a point, because after that point, you would start noticing that it doesn't really make sense. So I'm trying to explain why what Locke is thinking makes sense. <laughs> and to explain why it makes sense, I, you would have to step back and take a more abstract look at like what we mean by saying that a property is really in something and so forth. Um, Oh, okay, and someone wants me to define nominalism again. So, I mean, there's a lot of different varieties of nominalism, but in general, like nominalism about a purported type of thing is saying that there is no such thing, there's just a name for it. <laughs> so, nominalism about a power means saying we have a name for the power, the power of fair face darkening this, but that name is not the name of anything. That's why, again, nominalism is always the opposite of realism. Um, realism is saying, yeah, there is such a thing. There is a race that the name is a name of. Um, like the most famous realist nominalist controversy is about universals. Um, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about uh, what in uh, like Aristotelian terminology we called realism versus nominalism about accidents. 
Um, but I mean, never mind that. It's still it's 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 definitely an example of that type of controversy I'm talking about. Is there a thing that has this name, or is it just a name? Now, I mean, when we say there's just a name, of course, of course, some nominalists, and maybe, well, I mean, Hobbes in a way does maintain this, and maybe some early medieval nominalists thought something like this, but that, you know, nominalism has a reputation of saying this is just a name, meaning like it's a noise, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> um, but of course, that's not what we're talking about here. This name has a perfectly good relationship to a real important description of the sun, which, you know, you would need to know when you, if your face happens to be kind of fair like mine, the, before you go out to the sun, you might want to put some sunscreen in because the sun has this power, right? Like, that's not nonsense. It's not noises. It's really important. It's just that, um, but it does seem to name a thing where there is no separate thing. That's what the nominalism part is. Okay. That, um, that question was a direct message, so people couldn't see the question, but I'm sure other people also had the question. <laughs> so I'm um, glad someone asked. Okay. Um, all right, so now I'm going to go back into more detail and try to, well, basically try to answer this question or say, like, what is, well, answer, answer this question better and in the process answer this question. So what does Locke, you know, actually mean when it comes down to it by saying that a certain power is a thing in the substance? And why should we think that the primary qualities and only the primary qualities are that. So, um, okay, I already said that. Oh, okay. So um, to explain this, I need to bring in one more thing that Locke says about the difference between primary qualities and secondary qualities. Um, So he says that primary qualities are real, as we said, and they resemble our ideas. Whereas secondary qualities are not real and they don't resemble our ideas. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so, um, right, so the first part I've explained as best I can what it, what it's, what I think it's supposed to mean or what it, what has, we have to explain how it means that, so to speak, but what it's supposed to mean that they're real powers as opposed to bare powers. But the question is, what does this second part mean, resemble our ideas? Now, I mean, um, you might think, I think you probably wouldn't think this very long before you noticed that there was something weird about it. You might think, well, this is pretty straightforward, you know, like, here I am here, and here's my idea of the shape of the snowball, and here's the shape of the snowball, and this looks just like this. They resemble each other. Okay, so, I mean, the problem with that is, like, what does it mean for something to look like something, according to Locke? To look like something is to cause me to perceive a certain visual idea under the right conditions. So if I want to know what this looks like, there's only one way to find out what it looks like. Turn my eye towards it. 
and see what idea it causes me to perceive, and that's what it looks like. That's what it means that it looks like that. So um, I can't turn around and compare this to what it really looks like if I look at it without my idea, so to speak. Right? Like, I can't get around my idea and look at it directly and see what it really looks like. What it looks like is what idea it causes in me when I, to, me to perceive when I look at it. That's the whole story. So if we thought resemble meant that I'm supposed to compare what the idea looks like to what the thing looks like, that doesn't really make any sense. Do, do people want to understand why I'm saying that doesn't make sense? I mean, maybe I can make it clearer, although I feel like this maybe brings in an in, uh, unnecessary complication, but I can make it clearer by saying, like, how would we know if it doesn't look like, look like our idea? How could we know that? You know... Let's suppose the snowball, the shape of the snowball is really like this. But whenever anyone looks at it, it causes this idea in their head. Uh, April asks, is this related to a thing in itself? It is related to a thing in itself, in at least one of the meanings of in itself. Um, but not maybe in the simplest way you might think. But in any case, um, that's all I can say about it now. Um, am I teaching 106 next year? I don't remember. If I am, you could take that to, to hear me talk about things in themselves ad nauseum. All right. But anyway, right, like suppose, again, suppose it didn't really look like our ideas of it. How would we know that? Well, I mean, by didn't really look like, I mean, didn't really feel like them either, of course, right? You know, and again, as I said, I think even though Locke, like most philosophers, talks a lot about vision, I think when it comes down to it, he thinks the primary qualities are primarily tangible qualities, not visible qualities. So, so you know, the question is, suppose it's really this shape, but whenever anyone feels it, it feels like this shape. Well, we couldn't know that, right? I mean, <laughs> um, again, when we, when, we, when we say what shape something is, all we can be talking about it is what shape idea it causes in us. We don't have some other way of feeling it. Okay, someone else has asked, is this because we have an idea of ball and an idea of snow? Don't quite understand that question. Um, is it because we have an idea of ball and an idea of snow? If what you mean is something like the reason the shape can be considered separately from the snowballs, that we have a separate idea. Yeah, snowball is a compound word. I mean, maybe for that reason. It, I mean, I'm using it because it's, it's one of Locke's examples, basically. Uh, maybe it would have been less confusing to use some other word that's not compound, like grape. Except they're not all the same color, but... Anyway, um, yeah, snowball is definitely a compound word, yes. No, but what I was going to say is, yes, we have an idea of snow and an idea of a ball. We also have an idea of snow and an idea of white. That applies to both the primary and secondary qualities. Um, um in some other situation, we might call a snowball a white ball. Right? Like if all the balls all over the place were made of snow, we're only interested in the white ones. The others have been painted purple or whatever. We might call it a white ball. <laughs> That's 
right? So, I mean, yes, clearly we can, this is the thing that I want to discuss a little bit at the end, but I'm not sure I'm going to have any time for it. But clearly we can abstract the property of sphericity and consider it separately from this snowball or from any ball. But the same thing is true of whiteness. So that's not, it's not really relevant to the issue here. Um, okay, so I, so I think I went into this just to rule out what might seem like an easy way of understanding what resemblance means. I think resem what resemblance actually means here is something that, from Locke's point of view, um, goes hand in hand with the other thing. In other words, these are not two separate criteria. They go together. And I think they go together because of something special about the primary qualities that, in a sense, has already come up in that chapter about solidity. But Locke doesn't actually um, mention explicitly until much later in book four. So, spoiler alert, now I'm going to show you something from book four. So, this is book four, chapter three, section... 14 on page 485 at the top. Oops, I can't see it. Some few of the primary qualities have a necessary dependence and visible connection one with another. As figure necessarily supposes extension, receiving or communicating motion by impulse supposes solidity. So what he's saying the, is, that is characteristic of primary ideas is, and sorry, did he say primary ideas? No, he said primary qualities. That's what he should have said. Well, he should have said ideas of primary qualities. All right, Locke, as he... As he promises or threatens, as soon as he introduces the distinction between ideas and qualities, um, is not always that careful about it, right? Even though the idea of white is something in my mind and the quality of white is a power that something outside of my mind has to cause an operation in me, so they're really not the same thing at all, sometimes he'll call the quality the idea or vice versa, or he won't be precise which he's talking about. I'm going to try to keep them straight, but I understand why it was hard for him to keep it straight, because it is hard to keep it straight. I mean, that might be a sign that the whole thing is made up. That's what actually Barclay is going to say, first of several people who have said that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, um, assuming it's not all made up, it's important to keep the difference straight. So, right, so what he's saying is, with some of the ideas of primary qualities, even though they're simple, we can see that they're necessarily connected somehow to, to each other. Now, I mean, a very simple version of that would be, if this one is there, then this one will have to be there, or something like that. But... Um, uh, and he gives examples like that in that passage. They're not very exciting examples. Figure supposes extension. Um, I mean, I guess that's already important, except that figure and extension are not really simple ideas. So, But, I mean, here's a more complicated example. Solidity is a simple idea. Now, I mean... There's also an idea, which is not simple, which is very complicated, of no body being able to go into the space where this one is while it remains in its space. 
So the idea of solidity I get just by touching this body. So these are supposed to be the ideas, right? Yeah, this is the idea of solidity. This is the idea of impenetrability, let's say. The idea of impenetrability is actually not simple, it's complicated. But when I reach out my finger and touch something, it causes me to perceive this idea of solidity. But there's a visible necessary connection between this idea of solidity and this other idea of impenetrability. That's probably not at all readable, I'm sorry. Right, so, so this is the beginning of the explanation of what seemed puzzling about the idea of solidity. I can't define it. I can't tell you what the idea of solidity is. You have to feel it. But I know something else about it that I can tell you. Namely, that whatever has the quality of solidity, that is the power to get you to perceive this idea, also has the property of impenetrability. Um, and it's not because impenetrability is somehow contained in the idea of solidity. Nothing is contained in the idea of solidity because solidity is a simple idea. But it's just that somehow, just from perceiving this simple idea, we know it necessarily goes along with other stuff. Um, so someone asked about the Kantian term thing in itself before, but, you know, here's a place where it's worth introducing a Kantian term. As Kant would say, this, the knowledge of the, of the agreement of these two ideas is synthetic, not analytic. We're not just unfolding what's contained in the idea of solidity because it's simple. There's nothing in it contained in it. We're attaching it to something else, a different idea. And yet, um, it's, as Kant would say, synthetic a priori. We don't learn this from a lot of experience of solid things being impenetrable. Rather, it's a visible necessary connection. As soon as we get the idea of solidity, without any experience at all, we know. Right? As soon as I feel that sensation, I know that the body will resist my hands coming together while it's still in place. That's what primary qualities have that secondary qualities don't. Now, how is that related to resemblance in the reality of a power. Well, so like here's an example. Um, here's an example coming up. I'm not going to read this from the. Should I? No, I'll just I'll just read it from my notes here. This is from uh, chapter 13, so it's in uh, the reading for Thursday, I believe. For the mind having a power to repeat the idea of any length. Oh, there's a right hand raised. Sorry. Oh, Carissa, yeah. Did you have a question? So, yeah, I have a question. So, my understanding is like, um, can we understand resemblance as perceivable, sensible quality? Uh, you need to experience the item empirically to compare the sensual experience to your past experience of experiencing a similar item. And that process is figuring out the resemblance between the two experiences. And that whole process is like called resemblance. Whereas secondary qualities are just some um, side effects of the power. And like more like the affected object's individual particular reaction to the power. Can we understand like that? 
Well, okay. So, I mean, it would make sense to, I think what you're saying, it would make sense to ask. I was saying before, it doesn't make sense to ask, does my idea resemble the thing? Okay. In, in, in that way, does it have like, does it look just like the thing or does it feel just like the thing that that doesn't but it would make sense to ask does it resemble my previous idea of the same thing or you know then i could compare these two ideas and see if they resemble each other do they look the same do they feel the same whatever that it, or are they the same look or feeling might be a better way to put it right um so uh but that's not going to distinguish between primary and secondary qualities because of course you know like if it's the same quality then sorry if it's the same idea then it resembles previous times i had the same idea right so like every time I've seen something white. The idea of white is the same. It resembles the previous ideas of white. Here we're trying to ask about a relationship of resemblance not between different ideas, but between the ideas and the thing. And that's what makes it hard to understand. So, um, okay, so anyway, so let me finish reading this example. Well, there's only three minutes left. Oh, wow. Okay. For the mind having a power to repeat the idea of any length, or else to join it to another with what inclination it will, and so make what sort of angle it pleases, till it has wholly enclosed any space. That's Locke's ex uh, um, explanation in chapter 13 of how from basic ideas of extension we can form the ideas of many different shapes. So we can repeat an extension as often as we like, and join it to others at any incidence, that is, at any angle, until we have closed any space. So we can form the idea of a triangle, for example. But, you know, he's leaving something out there. Suppose I want to join one extension to another, such as to enclose a space. I can't do it. <laughs> Two isn't enough. Moreover, suppose I want a third one here to, to close the space. Let's say I add this one. No, no, that's not. No, let me see. No, I have to make it too long. Suppose I try adding this one. I can't use these three, three lengths to make a triangle. Right? So it's not actually true that the mind can um, enclose space by joining extensions to each other however it pleases. It has to do it in a very precise way. There have to be, I mean, there's a lot of conditions actually, but one is there have to be at least three lengths. And um, the length of each side has to be shorter than the sum of the lengths of the two other sides. Right? That's called the triangle inequality. Um, this side has to be shorter than the sum of the lengths of these two sides. Then, if I get the angles right, but I don't have any choice of angles, I have to have exactly the right angles, then I can use them to enclose a space. How do I know all of that? Um, so some more radical empiricists than Locke will say, I know all of that by experience. You know, I've seen lots of lines in my life and they only enclosed a space when blah, blah, blah. But that's not what Locke says, I, I'm pretty sure. And we'll see more examples, like reason to think this coming up. Locke says, no, there's visible necessary connections. Right? It's like a necessary property of lines and triangles and angles in their relationship to each other, that you can only make these lines as line segments to make a triangle if the following conditions hold. 
We don't learn that from experience. You might say, wait, I thought Locke thought we didn't have any innate ideas. Indeed, he thinks we don't have innate ideas. Where did we get the idea of a line in the first place? Locke will say, from experience. So before we experienced any lines, we couldn't know this about lines or triangles because we didn't have the idea. But once we have the idea, in the case of some few ideas of primary qualities, then a, necess a, a necessary connection becomes visible immediately. And I see I'm out of time. Boy, it's even worse than I thought. I don't know what's going to happen at the beginning next time. But anyway, um, I'll, I'll just say one last thing, which is that um, if these ideas necessarily have a necessary connection between them, then there must be a necessary connection between the powers that cause me to perceive them. Maybe I should draw it again back with just two, like connected together. These ideas are necessarily connected, but we also know they only come when there's a power to cause them in me. So if this one can't come without this one, this power can't come without this power. So the resemblance is that there's like an isomorphism between the structure of my ideas and the structure of powers in the thing. There's a certain threeness to my idea of a triangle. And even though I can't say what that looks like in the thing, other than that it causes me to perceive a triangle, I can say because there's this necessary structure in my ideas, that there must be a corresponding necessary structure in the thing, and therefore that there's a certain threeness in it, that I can count three powers in the thing. And that's what I think uh, it, that is in the substance. And that's what I think Locke means by saying there's separate things in the substance that are the powers. Right? That is, from my ideas, I've learned something about the structure of powers in the external substance. Okay, I know that wasn't nearly as clear as it should have been, and I'm over time, which I apologize for. I'll see what I can do about this at the beginning next time, and uh, I'll see you then. Okay, bye.